Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Akucha, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the part two of our government revenue sources. Uh, in this video, we're really focusing on the local side of government revenue. In the previous videos, we looked at the theory of taxation, uh, rather how to figure out a just and fair method or uh, tax regime. And we looked at the main sources of revenue at the federal and provincial level. Here, big difference, we shift our attention to the local level, and this is because, well, the local tax base is really greatly restricted, as, well, the local government being the most junior of the governments being evaluated here, they have the least level of authority to actually raise revenues. So, as we get through this video, what we'll really be taking a look at is just the primary sources of revenue for local government and some of the issues that arise with these. What are our learning outcomes? What are our goals by the end of this video? Well, by the end of this session, we will be able to identify the primary revenue sources for local government, as well as recognize the difficulties faced by local governments in implementing fair and just methods of taxation. So again, keep in mind, fair and just methods of taxation, we looked at that in video one. This is getting back to our whole notions of horizontal equity and vertical equity we'll see that it's very difficult for municipalities, for regional districts, that is our local governments, to have a really just level of taxation that is a tax regime that satisfies horizontal and vertical equity. Okay, again, just like with the last video, I'll have a few things to add in, a few things to kind of uh, throw up on the screen to look at visually, but for the most part, all our important information is presented through audio. Meaning, if you want to throw on some headphones and just walk around and listen to this, that works just fine. That being said, let's go jump over and let's have our blackboard and take a look at what we have going on here. When talking about local governments, the primary source of revenue for these local governments, again, this could be a municipality or a regional district, their primary source of revenue is the property tax. So historically, there's been a bit of conflict of interest in this. That is, historically, these local governments, they set both property values. So we'll go property values and the tax rate. So historically, and in many areas around the world, around Canada, this is still done. These local municipalities, they determine, hey, what are all the buildings? What are all the properties within our service area within our municipality worth? What are they valued at? And then at what rate are we going to tax them? In BC here, this was decided that, hey, you know what, this might be a little bit of a conflict of interest for the municipalities to jointly be, be determining what everything is worth, as well as at what rate we're going to tax them based off their value. And so what we created was the BC Assessment Authority. Assessment Authority. Uh, again, trying to abbreviate that, that is BCAA. That is not the BC Automobile Association, that is the BC Assessment Authority. This was founded in 1974. So the BC Assessment Authority, their sole purpose is to go and kind of value every single property in the province and figure out, hey, if it was able to be put up for sale and if it was to be sold, what is the fair market value of this property? And by assessing the market price of this value, uh, sorry, by assessing the market value of this property, we can then put a value to the property and thus create a basis for taxation. So based off of this, local governments can then create a rate at which they tax these properties and begin to essentially get their tax revenue. But there's some big kind of exemptions as we go through this. Uh, we will evaluate as we go along, but provincial and federal land is actually exempt from local taxation. And I mean, if we just think about this, it doesn't make sense that a senior level of government is kind of being bounded by a junior level of government to say, hey, senior level of government, you have to pay me taxes. Doesn't really make sense, right? So in this case here, because local is the most junior, they have no authority over the provincial or the federal. So they don't get to say to the provincial or the federal governments, hey, you owe us money. Doesn't work. So provincial, federal government, any buildings they own in a regional district, in a municipality are exempt from property tax. 
Beyond that, there's additional exemptions that do uh, arise. For example, just to kind of list through a few, churches, cemeteries, schools, hospitals, libraries, and a lot of other establishments that are in place for public nonprofit use. So you can imagine rec centers and the like, as long as they're meant for public nonprofit use, they're typically exempted from property tax. So you can just see with that, okay, property tax is the primary, by far and large, the primary source of revenue for our local governments. And we see there's a lot of kind of exceptions in there. Kind of see maybe the reason where, hey, somewhere like the CRD here, where we have 13 municipalities all jam-packed close to each other, why one municipality would be like, hey, we need a new hospital, but maybe not within our zone. And the reason they don't say, hey, maybe not within our zone, is because, hey, you build that hospital, that's no tax revenue now. You don't get to get property taxes from that hospital, meaning you've essentially lost out. That's an opportunity cost. You could have developed something else there instead. You could have received the tax revenue from it, but by putting in a school, by putting in a hospital, by putting in one of these other public services, you lose out on that tax revenue. Now, always a trade-off, right? These public goods, these things need to be provided. They need to be kind of built and made available for your citizens. So there is, of course, that trade-off. It's not just, hey, sorry, we're never building hospitals because we lose out on property tax. Uh, your people would be pretty upset about that. So again, as with anything in life, it is filled with trade-offs. Trade-offs means that, hey, we have an opportunity cost. So the BC Assessment Authority, they go and they assess all the properties within the province and they give them some value. From this, our community charter, they require local government to pass a bylaw every year by the 15th of May to determine applicable tax rates and for all land and taxable improvements within their area. So within their regional boundary or within their municipality. This annual tax levy is then determined to be raised and outlined in the local government's financial plan. Local governments often go and they assign different tax rates to different classes of land or different types of property. And we can take a look at a hypothetical kind of case of this here. So here what we see is we see our tax rate in terms of dollars per uh, so this is how many dollars you're taxed per thousand dollars of property value. So for example, in our scenario here, we would say residential property has a tax rate of $4 per thousand dollars of value. And that would be our base multiple. So that is just our standard case. As you go through, as you have your different zoning types or your different uh, assessment classes from utilities, major industry, light industry, business, Nonprofit and farm, we have different tax rates. That again is the tax rate per thousand dollars and the corresponding multiple. That is, hey, how many more times the base multiple did they pay? Or in the case of farm, we see that, hey, farms typically pay less tax and so they have that 0.5 multiple. They pay half what a residential owner does. In this way, here we can also see the two purposes of taxation. Right, our two purposes of taxation was to generate revenue and to change incentives. So in this case here, it might be one of those things where, okay, yes, we want to have a, you know some utilities being provided here within our municipality, but even though we're zoning, even though we're allowing for it, uh, we don't want too many. Right? We really want to limit the amount of utilities being done, or we want to really limit the amount of major industry that takes place. Sure, there might be demand for it, so yes, we're going to allow it to pop up if it does pop up, but what we're going to do is in order to change the incentives to kind of make them look to go elsewhere, we're going to charge a non-favorable tax rate. And by charging this non-favorable tax rate on that type of service or that type of industry or that type of zoning, we can kind of encourage we can kind of encourage development to be along the lines as to how we see it ought to be based off of our official community plan or based off the council's direction. Same thing can be said for different kinds of 
tax rates for residential versus business, on and on and on. Right? You can even throw in different tax rates for your property versus your improvements. So all of that can be said to kind of encourage more improvements, less property just being held on to. All of that works out. We get our different tax rates. This is all passed, and then we get our actual property tax bill. So how does this work out? Let's take a look at a brief example. Let's say that your house, let's say that your house is valued at $400,000. Now, okay, given the current scheme of things here in British Columbia, specifically here on the South Island, a $400,000 house, this would be a steal. But well, let's go with this example. So $400,000 house, uh, what would we pay in property taxes for this? Well, this $400,000 house is taxed at a tax rate of $4 per thousand dollars of value. So, okay, we do 400,000 divided by 1,000 to get our number of thousands we have. And then we times that by four to get our actual property tax that is owed. And we see that that works out to be $1,600 in property tax to the city. What if instead this was not uh, not a residence, but rather it was being zoned for business? Or occasionally we see this where, hey, it is a house in a residential area, but it's primarily being utilized for a business. Primarily, let's say, right, it's a doctor's office being run out of a house or a dentist office being run out of a house. You see these from time to time, especially in older parts of town, denser parts of town, such as actual parts of Victoria, Fernwood, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case here, still 400,000, but it's no longer being classified as residential. It's being classified as our class six here, business. So, hey, our business rate is $10 per thousand. And so we see the impact of that changes our property taxes due from 1600 If we're zoned as that business, we're going to pay 4000 in property tax. So we see the mill rate, that is our tax rate per $1,000. And we see the impact that it has on our actual property taxes due based off of our classification of the property whether we're uh, classified as a residential property, a business, or something else altogether. As we said, ultimately, council will set the tax rates for each class in order to achieve its political or economic objectives. As we said, right, taxation serves as two roles, either revenue objectives or to change the levels of incentives. Beyond this tax rate, there is actually, unfortunately, usually more. Uh, that is, if we were to take a look at that residential side, it's saying, hey, your $400,000 property gets levied, yeah, a $1,600 property tax. Well, that is just what's being levied by city council. There are actually several other, um, how to put this, several other different provincial or regional services being provided that ultimately get their revenue through property taxes as well. So 1600 is what goes towards their local city council based off of their tax rate, but several other services get their revenue through this as well. And as a result on your property tax, you will also see charges for the BC Assessment Authority. Hey, they're going around, they're assessing every property in the province. They get paid to do so by taking a little bit off of everyone's property tax. You'd also see, depending on where you live, transit, Yes, your transit fare pays for part of transit, but it just pays for part of it. The rest of it is subsidized through taxation. Uh, you can have sewer improvements. Uh, what else could you have? You can have hospital. And sometimes, actually frequently, you'll also have school. So some school district charges. And then above that, we can also have additional charges for police, fire, uh, improvement dis uh, districts, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these would be extra levies being charged on top of, above and beyond that $1,600 for your local government. So just kind of that heads up that, hey, yes, local government determines their tax rate. That is not the entirety of the property tax. Many other things that get thrown on there as well. Now, if you want to think about kind of the fairness or the justness of a property tax, we can think about that in terms of our horizontal 
and our vertical equity. And again, horizontal equity is kind of getting at the idea that people with equivalent incomes would pay equivalent taxes. Our vertical equity being that people who pay, or sorry, people who earn more income would get taxed at a higher rate. Well, what we see is that in all kind of classifications here, a property tax is entirely regressive. From the vertical side, because that's really what we're getting at when we talk about regressive, is it doesn't matter if you, right, if we have this $400,000 property, if you make a million dollars, you're paying this $1,600 in property tax. If you are a retired pensioner bringing in just barely enough to get by, well, again, if your place is worth this $400,000, you're still paying the $1,600 in property taxes, meaning that pensioner, this is a significantly larger part of their income than it would be for that millionaire. So in this case here, it's strictly regressive in this case because it's strictly based off of your wealth, based off of the value of what you have in your assets. And as we said, hey, we've thought, and there's a lot of debate currently about introducing these kind of ideas of this wealth tax. We do have a wealth tax in the property tax, but what we see with it is that a wealth tax is regressive because, hey, just because you have a lot of wealth, just because you have this high value of assets, doesn't actually always mean that you have a high level of income. Sometimes you just bought at the right time, your income is still next to nothing, and you start taxing people based off of that wealth, and they really don't have any ways to make ends meet, especially when that asset is their house, which is also their primary source of shelter. You can't necessarily liquidate that in order to pay the taxes and still have somewhere to live. So problematic, some of our controversy with kind of a wealth tax. What about horizontal equity? Well, horizontal equity, as we said, is that people who earn the same amount of money pay the same amount in tax. Well, again, this is not necessarily true. We could have two individuals, both of which earn, say, 200000 because let's be honest, that's what you would have to earn to be able to afford a place in Greater Victoria today. And even then, right, might get you a nice condo if you earn two hundred grand a year. Okay, I, I exaggerate, but not, not by much. Okay, so we have these two people each earning about that much. Well, let's say the first one goes and really extends themselves and buys a house for, well, we're going to go 800000 The second one, the second guy goes, you know what? I don't want to extend myself, don't want to be house poor. I'm just going to go buy a unit in a condo, and I'm going to buy a unit in a condo for, ah, uh, what? 500,000? Okay, so we have our two different uh, scenarios here. Same income, different values of property in this case. What ends up happening? Well, our guy who went and bought the bigger house will pay more in property tax. And yeah, of course they pay more. They have the higher valued asset in this case. But what we see is when talking about horizontal equity, that those with the same income pay approximately the same amount of tax we see that this horizontal equity principle is not upheld because it's not based off of income. It's based off of your assets. So we see that the property tax fails on both a fair tax system in both a horizontal and vertical equity sense. Let's take a brief aside here. Let's uh, talk about what happens if, right going back to that horizontal or that vertical equity side, what happens if, hey, you have all this equity, that is, you have all this value of your assets, you're getting taxed a large amount because your house is worth a lot, but you don't really have the income to pay your taxes. What happens if you don't pay your property taxes? Well, if you don't pay your taxes, there's kind of a multi-step, multi-year process in which uh, you have to deal with everything and in which the city has to deal with you before they can get uh Full payment of all of their outstanding tax liability. But the first thing is, is in your first year, you need to pay your taxes by the deadline. And this deadline is due typically middle of the year, around June sometime. And if you don't get that paid, there is a 10% fee that is then levied onto your tax. Many municipalities, yeah, they say, okay, we could do this. We're actually going to have a two-part system. 
Sure, we have our final deadline, but what we're going to do is we're going to move up earlier and have an early deadline. And if you miss this early deadline, we'll levy a first 5% fee. And then if you miss the actual deadline, well, then we'll levy an additional 5% fee. Again, making up our full 10%, but kind of encouraging this early payment and then the actual payment. So breaking it up into two dates there. What happens if you miss this deadline? What happens if the deadline comes and goes and you still don't pay your taxes? Well, if they're not paid, so not paid by December 31st of that year, so that's the first year that they were due. We can write down here year one. So if they're not paid by December 31st, well, your taxes are now delinquent. So in this case here, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. They're not delinquent yet. If they are not paid by December 31st of that year one, we would just say that they are in arrears. You can kind of guess what's happening next. Okay, so they're in arrears at this case. And once they're in arrears, they're subject to daily interest. So okay, at this point here, if you want to make amends, if you want to make your payment and get in the good books again with the city, you need to pay your full property tax you need to pay your 10% fee, and you need to pay your daily interest that is being levied on your property taxes. So that is every day, it's becoming more and more expensive, more and more difficult to really get resolution for this outstanding payment. What happens if you don't meet this? What happens if, okay, these taxes have, these taxes have been levied, you don't pay them, you don't pay the fee, and you don't pay the interest? Well. If they are again not paid by December 31st, and this is again of the next year, so we'll go year two. So at this point here, at this point, well, you are now delinquent. All right, as I said, you can probably guess what comes next. I gave it away in the last one. So at this point here, you are now delinquent, not how you spell delinquent, but my fan slip. There should be an E in there, delinquent, but there we go, we have it. At this point here, your taxes are delinquent. Essentially, yes, you have your one year's outstanding fee, daily interest. You have your next year's outstanding fee, daily interest. You're in a lot of trouble at this point. It's going to be pretty difficult for you to make, uh, for you to make amends with the city. But it's still possible, right? You still have a lot of money that you would owe, but it's doable. What happens if you still don't? Well, if still not paid, and this is still not paid by December 31st, by the end of this third year. Well, now, now your property is subject to a tax sale. That is, you have not paid your property taxes. The city comes and they expropriate your property. It is now theirs. They now own it because you couldn't pay your taxes. And now it is up and is being listed for a tax sale. These tax sales happen. When do they happen? They happen in the last Monday in September. So last Monday of September, every year, all of these properties that have been captured, repossessed by the city, end up being listed off for sale. And in being able to sell them off, well, come this year four, the property is sold off. As the property is sold off, the title is transferred to the purchaser. As this property title is transferred to the purchaser, the purchaser, well, purchases the property and the funds of the sale go to make restitution to the city for the outstanding taxes with anything extra, if there's anything extra left over, being dispersed to the original owner of the property. So, right, you don't lose it all. You can potentially get some back to you, but it's after the city gets their outstanding taxes. If there is no purchaser, well, then the property title is transferred to the municipality. That is, the city now owns the house, and the city can then go and seek other means to get restitution. So they can go and they can begin to rent out the property, for example. Okay, so a little bit of an aside as to what happens if you were unable to make your property tax payments. And this is actually a big issue because we said there's a lot of problems with horizontal equity, a lot of problems with vertical equity with property taxes. 
just because you have an extremely high valued asset, an extremely high valued house, does not mean you necessarily make a lot of money. We see this in a lot of places in Vancouver. We see this in a lot of places in kind of the outskirts of Vancouver, especially where you have these people who bought way out there back in the day when it was cheap. It was more or less the boonies. And now it's the desirable place to live. And they have this million, multi-million dollar house. And they can hardly even afford to maintain it and keep it up, let alone pay the property tax bill. To a degree, here in the South Island, we see this in Oak Bay. Today, Oak Bay is kind of the place to be. It's uh, the yuppity place with the extremely high property values. But not very long ago, it was out in the boonies. It was kind of just, yeah, that place quite a ways away from everything. Nothing really happening there. And places were relatively cheap. As a result, right, I'm not talking about all of Oak Bay. There's always been places that have been ritzy out there. But areas of it where, yeah, it was out there. And it was kind of like you could get cheap properties. Cheap properties because you didn't earn a ton of money. Now, you're still not earning a ton of money, but your property is worth multi-millions. You're going to have a hard time just meeting that property tax commitment. And thus, potentially running into this issue of arrears, delinquency, and tax sale. Carrying on, what are some of our big issues with local taxation? Well, one of the big issues with local taxation is, as we've already alluded to, is this fact that our local municipalities, they cannot tax our senior levels of government. So especially, this is a problem in, say, I don't know, a municipality like Victoria that has a lot of provincial government offices. So a lot of provincial land, in this case here, that's a lot of land that the city of Victoria cannot collect tax revenue from. Problematic for them. Well, fortunately, both the federal and the provincial governments, they provide grants in lieu of taxes. So a grant in lieu of taxes, it just kind of recognizes, hey, yes, we are underneath all obligation to pay you a property tax, but we recognize that we're using up land that you could have gained revenue from. So we're going to provide you a grant in lieu of the property tax. And this kind of offsets, right, offsets the cost of having federal or provincial property in your jurisdiction. Great. Problem is, is that often these grants are given out as intermediate grants and they can be repealed up to 10 years after the fact. That is up to 10 years after the fact, the government, the ministry, the department can take a look at it and go, you know what, we think that you actually valued our property too high or you put too high of a tax rate on our property. That grant we gave you eight years ago, ah, we paid you too much money. We need some of it back. So while these grants are useful for municipalities to actually provide them revenue in lieu of actual taxes, they're also problematic because the government to the higher levels of government can repeal them, pull them back, ask for repayment, and then reissue the grant for a lesser amount. So again, especially in municipalities like Victoria that have substantial tracts of federal and provincial land, this is problematic. I say Victoria, I guess it's a squimalt that has mostly the federal land, a squimalt through into Colwood uh, with our with the Navy base and all of that through there. Outside of this, right, so that's one of our big issues with our revenue generation is the role of our senior levels of government. We can also take a look at some of our other forms of revenues available to our cities, to our municipalities, to our local governments. And that is, right, first one was property taxes. Next one, kind of as we're on the topic of it, our next one is grants. I guess I should spell that right. It's not a Gantt, it's a grant. There we go. Grants. And while the primary grant they receive is that grant in lieu of taxes, as seen, there are also other grants that do exist. And these other grants that do exist are both conditional, that is, grants that exist to say, hey, we'll give you money. That is, the provincial or the federal government says, hey, we'll give you money. But this money must be spent on transit, must be spent on infrastructure, 
right? There's strings attached. There's specific things this money needs to be spent on. Or one of the big things being floated right now by the provincial governments is saying, hey, we'll give you money, but you have to relax your zoning bylaws. You have to be willing to let more density go in. And if you're willing to let more density go in, we will give you grants. If you're not willing to restrict your zoning, sorry, relax your zoning bylaws, well, if they're not relaxed, we aren't going to give you money. So the conditional grants are a way for provincial, federal levels of government to influence the local government to kind of dangle that carrot and say, hey, here you go, here's a little treat, but there's a string attached. There are also, of course, also unconditional grants. Where an unconditional grant is, well, as the name suggests, unconditional. These are also known as block grants, where they just provide funding. Here you go, municipality. Here you go, local government. Here's a bunch of money. You can do with it as you will. We don't have strings attached. We don't have a clause attached to it as to where the money has to go. This is entirely just extra money for you to meet your revenue needs. Now, in talking about our grants, both the grants in lieu of taxes, as well as just these conditional, unconditional grants, we don't really have an issue when we're talking about our equity, right? There's no part here where we're talking about the horizontal equity or the vertical equity of these grants because they're non-taxation. They're strictly coming just from a senior level of government. So not something we need to concern ourselves about with the fairness of this local tax regime. The next one, though, the next one we're going to take a look at is another source of revenue for our local governments is user fees, uh, user fees and non-tax sources. So what do we have going on here? Well, user fees, they can actually be a very large revenue source for some local governments. These user fees, these are very, very useful when a beneficiary of a good or service can be readily identified. So. For example, you build yourself a swimming pool. Hey, you can identify who's going to benefit from the swimming pool and you charge the user fees to these users. That is, right, the people who are going to benefit are the people going to go swim. So you charge them a user fee to go utilize the pool and in doing so, you help to pay for that pool and then once it's paid off, well, you then get money coming in to fund other services. So great. Again, this only really works when the good or service in question, the beneficiary can be readily identified. This doesn't always work, right? Some examples where this does work would be garbage. Well, hey, we can easily charge you for garbage for every bin you put out because you get the benefit of getting your garbage taken, getting rid of. Sewer, same idea. Access fees, we talked about that. Access fees for rec centers. Um, also, publicly owned properties. Often there's convention centers, right? We have the Victoria Convention Center. So renting that out. Well, again, beneficiary is easily identifiable and we can charge them for the use. Also, parking fees, right? Hey, the right to park in the zone, you get paid for parking. Sorry, you don't get paid for parking. You pay for parking. And in doing so, the local municipality earns that revenue. Often also some municipalities, some local governments will own real estate and they will then rent out these real estate units and earn rental income from this. Uh, this can often be the case if we have low income or subsidized housing being provided by the municipality. So again, thinking about these user fees. Thinking about these user fees, again, in terms of a fairness of our tax regime, so through a horizontal, and through a vertical equity system. Well, what we see is that again, they fail on both cases because they are entirely just you signaling to yourself, hey, I'm willing to pay these user fees to go swimming or to access this service or on and on and on. We see that even for the basic ones, like, hey, user fees for garbage, for sewer, for water, these utilities, well, hey, if you're paying a user fee for this and you're paying based off of use, well, it's possible to have two individuals with the same income paying different amounts in user fees based off of their use. So fails our test of horizontal equity. Very similarly, in the vertical equity case, 
even if both individuals use this in the same degree, well, if we have a relatively poorer person, they go swimming once a month, that could be a relatively large portion of their income that they have to pay in user fees. If we have a relatively rich person going swimming once a month, that's going to be really not much as a proportion of their total income. So we see again in our vertical case, the implementation of revenue generation through user fees is regressive in nature. That is, it disproportionately is weighted towards those with less income. And that's problematic. That's problematic. What about these non-tax sources? What else do we have for this? Well, let's take a look at one of these non-tax sources. One of these non-tax sources is development. Uh, it helps if I can spell. Uh, development cost charges or DCCs. What these development cost charges are is really they're a key source of funds to provide capital upgrades. And we see this, right? People often joke as they walk through Langford or Callwood or Saanich, or I could keep going with municipalities, how we have this real oddity as, as you're walking through, you have a sidewalk and then it just ends. And then there's no sidewalk at all for a few blocks. And then it just starts again on the other side of the road. And it's like, what is going on? Why, why can't the city get its act together? Why don't we just have a continuous sidewalk or at least right, continue up until this point and then have a crosswalk across, something like that going on. What's going on here? Well, it's because a lot of these capital upgrades are actually paid for by development cost charges. And that is the DCC, it is a levy charge to developers in order to allow the developer to rezone or develop a given parcel. All right, essentially it's council saying, okay, yeah, sure, we'll let you develop this land, get the handsome profit you potentially get stand to gain from it, but we need you to do something for us too. We need you to build a sidewalk in front of the land you're developing. Hence the ad hoc sidewalks right here and there. Properties that have been developed or rezoned over time get sidewalks built in front. Older properties that have not been developed or not been updated, they don't have sidewalks out front. These funds go to provide really the, up, the necessary upgrades that are needed. So these go to provide sewer, storm drains, sidewalks as talked about, funds get uh, divvied aside into putting into parks, providing parking, traffic adjustment, so we can go on and on, right? These are gonna be the upgrades required to deal with the increased densification, to deal with the new demands being placed on neighborhoods. Some of these funds flow into general revenue, while others into self-liquidating funds to provide key services. So again, as we said, self-liquidating funds, that is, we'll identify, hey, some of these funds will go to providing sewer upgrades, water upgrades, et cetera, et cetera, as we go through. Okay, so that's an example of some other non-tax source. Uh, we have more though, we have more. What else do we have for a non-tax source? Uh, some additional non-tax sources are fees. Uh, let's change colors, let's change colors here. Let's uh, not keep using the same color here. There we go. So fees, these fees are really different than our user charges or our user fees. So up above, we talked about the user fees, which was, hey, you wanna go swimming, you gotta pay your $10 drop in to go to the pool. This is different. This isn't really, we're able to identify the beneficiary. This is more just a regulatory side of things. So this is just charging a fee in order to get a dog license, charging a fee to get a business license, a building permit, or any of these kind of things. That is different services being provided for, being provided by the local government and just charging a fee in order to access them. Again, the purpose of these are just strictly a regulatory side of things, just to, hey, we can raise some money while making sure this regulation is met, rather than identifying a beneficiary and making the beneficiary pay for their benefit. Okay, above and beyond this, okay, yeah, you have your local municipal fees, but we also have, if you're not aware, most municipalities in BC, they are policed by the RCMP. 
So, okay, with our municipal police force, so say Oak B, Oak B, Oak Bay police force or Victoria police force or Saanich police force, right? In each of these cases here, well, their fee revenue that's generated from their traffic stops, their tickets, all of that, well, a fraction of that goes back into the municipal coffers. With the RCMP, this was not the case. The RCMP just collected all of that revenue for themselves, and that went to offset their policing costs. Well, this was disputed and was argued, and finally, in 1999, so a good number of years ago, in 1999, it was finally realized and finally awarded that municipalities have a right to a fraction of all fine payments. So since then, well, part of these fees, sorry, I guess not really coming from that date of 1999, rather since 1999, some of these fees from the tickets, from the fines being issued by the RCMP they now enter our fee revenue as part of municipal revenue. Although, as you can imagine, this would be quite small overall. What else do we have? Well, for some local governments, they have interest income. Again, this really isn't too common. Uh, it's not too common because, well, you need to have a large amount of capital, financial capital sitting around that you could actually save and invest in order to be able to earn a return on. So some municipalities might have this, but more often than not, municipalities tend to be more cash strapped. So not so likely for this to take place, but it can happen, of course. Finally, last one we can take a look at is gaming revenue. So what's, what's this? Well, this, I mean, if you've kind of been listening in the news, it seems like every few years there's always this controversy in some municipality or another as to whether or not they should allow a casino to be built within the city limits. And the reason why this is such a big kind of controversy is because on one hand, often a lot of the residents don't want a casino being built because they view the casino as being a place for degenerates or something of the like. But on the other hand, the city is kind of saying, hey, a casino would be good for our area. And why would the city be saying this? Well, because the city is entitled to 10 to 16 percent of all gaming revenues coming from casinos within their jurisdiction. So by allowing a casino to be built within their jurisdiction, the municipality, that city, that regional district gets access to a sizable amount of that gaming revenue, which can really help their own municipal budgets. So again, an additional source, an additional non-tax source of revenue. So that covers off all of our revenue sources. And I mean, as we saw, as we looked at this, okay, property taxes being the main one, followed by user fees, grants, of course, are tucked in there as well, but property taxes, user fees, other sources, we saw that really everything across the board that we could kind of look as a fairness or a justness of this tax regime, everything at the local level kind of threw the local government to be rather regressive, rather backwards, rather unfair or unjust. And that's problematic. And not to say that local councils or local municipalities wouldn't want to have a more just or more fair tax regime, but it's the fact that they're bounded. They have very minimal ability, very minimal authority to raise tax revenue. And as such, they're kind of stuck with the tools they have. That being said, is there's also this final aspect, which is our debt financing. As discussed in the previous videos, when we were talking about budgeting at each levels, municipalities are restricted in their ability to borrow. That is, they cannot borrow. The authority to borrow really rests with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, it needs to be approved by them, subject to certain conditions as laid out in the community charter, and as well, subject to maximum aggregate amounts. That is, even if it could be approved and they could make a good case for it, there is a upper maximum as to what they can hit. In this case here, there's some justifications as to, okay, why a municipality could have long-term borrowings as well as short-term borrowings. So first, let's evaluate these long-term borrowings. Really, these long-term borrowings are for large infrastructure projects. So maybe you need to have massive road upgrades or sewers put in, or you're building a new rec center or a fire hall, police station, 
something like that, some large infrastructure expense such that you have insufficient revenue to meet it in this period. In this case here, yes, these municipalities often can borrow to be able to finance this, but there's some limits as to the terms of their debt. And that is the term of their debt cannot exceed either 30 years or the life of the project. And that is really the expected life of the project, or I should say rather not life of project, life of asset, right? So if they're building a new rec center, well, how long do they expect that? What's the economic life of that rec center? If the economic life of that rec center is only 25 years, well, 25 years is less than 30, meaning that this long-term debt could only be issued through a 25-year term to maturity. If, right, to kind of change that uh, up a bit, say this rec center was a bit better built and it had a 50-year economic life, well, okay, that's a much longer economic life, but now in this case here, they're going to be bounded by this other condition that is a maximum term on their debt of 30 years. So again, whatever the lesser of the two are is going to be their maximum term for their long-term debt. This long-term debt, it's issued, it's managed by our municipal finance authority. Really the big reason for this are MFA, MFA, municipal finance authority. The big purpose for this is to just be able to take all of our municipalities, big, small, in between, and have one agency deal with them. This really allows municipalities to get more favorable conditions and terms on their debt, get access to better rates. And on the flip side, we'll take a look at the opposite of debt, a surplus or savings next. It allows our municipalities to get good rates when they're saving funds as well. So again, it's essentially, you can, it's not really, but you can think of it as like a bank for your municipalities. A uh, way for the, uh, somebody who's come in, step up and be their private banker to get them the best loans, the best rates on their loans, and to get them the best savings accounts when they need to save money. What about the short-term debt? Well, this short-term debt, this is primarily uh, bridge financing. So bridge financing, that is, hey, you want to build a large project, but you need to wait for a large revenue source to come in, maybe tax time when all your money comes in all at once, or until long-term debt can be finalized. That is, hey, you're getting a long-term debt plan structured. You're working at finding the investors who are going to buy into this debt. This takes a little bit of time. So you need to break ground today or you need to break ground sooner than later. So until this goes ahead, you get some bridge financing to kind of bridge the difference. And that's, that's the key bit here, right? Bridge financing isn't financing to build a bridge. It's financing to bridge the gap between today and when your other sources come in. Whether those other sources be long-term debt or whether those other sources be your actual revenue that's coming. So bridge financing is to bridge that gap, not to build a bridge. Big distinction there. Another reason to have short-term debt is just like anybody else, uh, you might be running a surplus over the course of a year, but even though you're running a surplus over the course of a year, there might be days, there might be weeks, there might be months where your cash in doesn't equal your cash out. That is, in these short-term periods, your cash you run into cash flow issues. In order to ease that pain, you need essentially a line of credit we typically, on a personal side, often would just use our credit cards, right? Uh, this week, I need to spend a little bit more. All of a sudden, emergency expense. Credit card covers that balance, and then it gets paid off and short term. Same kind of idea here for municipalities. Over the course of a year, yes, they might be running a surplus, or yes, they might be balanced. But in the day-to-day, -day, in the month-to-month, -month, there might be occasions where they need to borrow for a month two months in order to equalize cash flows. That's the debt side of things. Let's take a look at the flip side of that, which would be taking a look at our reserves and other contributions. Surplus reserves and contributions, these are typically mandated to be held within specific accounts. So that is, okay, we're having a reserve, we're putting money aside, 
right? We can't just have a generic rainy day fund. It's going to be, okay, we're going to have this reserve to build a new park. We're going to have this reserve to build a new sewer system. Uh, typically, these are into a few different categories. We would have our capital works reserve it is often a big one that you would see. And right, this capital works reserve, this is going to be the provision for the replacement of infrastructure. You know your sewer line needs to be upgraded in 25 years. So every year you put aside 1 25th of your estimated cost in order to be able to get this done without having to massively raise taxes or borrow in order to do it. Prudent financial management. There's also going to be just our special purposes. Uh, your special purpose reserve, what's, uh, what's this for? Well, this would be a situation where council has earmarked funds for a specific project. That is, let's say in five years time, they want to go and build affordable housing or they want to do uh, some heritage conservation of a really old building in the municipality that they want to buy and save and restore. Or maybe they want to do some neighborhood improvements, right? Whatever this might be, whatever city council has decided, hey, we have this goal. Instead of borrowing to do it, we're going to throw aside a little bit of money every year, every month. And we're going to throw it aside with it specifically earmarked towards a special purpose. Third one, we've already talked about this, would be our DCCs. This is our development cost charges. Again, these development cost charges, whatever these funds are being used for, there must be a separate DCC account for each of these purposes. So, for example, if you're collecting funds from a developer and you're collecting a little bit, for different purposes, you must have one account that you're putting some percentage of it in for parks, some percentage in for, I don't know, sewer, some percentage in to ensure you have proper drainage. All of these different things that have been earmarked for the DCC funds, there must be a separate account for each of them, such that whenever these are collected, whatever the prescribed amount is, would go into each of these accounts. Beyond this, at our kind of really focusing in, right, uh, these other contributions that DCC would fit underneath that, our other side of our other contributions would really be donations. And this seems odd. A lot of people go, really? People are donating to the government? Um, yeah, this actually happens. Um, and this happens in a few different ways. Often you will get donations from certain groups in order to kind of, you know, play favorites, be like, hey, We'd like to see this happen. We'd like to see a new park built in this area. So we're going to donate funds to the city with the intent that this happens. And again, the city would then earmark those funds towards that purpose. Similarly, uh, there can be donations being put in in order to help establish or to maintain an arts and culture scene. These arts and culture scenes typically are going to be at least subsidized partly by the government. And even in this, the government level of subsidy may not be enough based off of what the actual people in the area want. And they may donate in addition to that to the government, to the provision of the arts and culture. So again, some other sources of revenue that exist. Finally, finally, last bit. I know I've said that a few times and then I'll keep going. Oh yeah, there's one more. There's one more. But this time I promise, this is the last one. <laughs> Uh, we also have other levels of government. Other levels, uh, sorry, not other levels. We've already talked about that. That's our grants. Other local government. And this might seem weird, right? You're like, really? Is Nanaimo going to go and give Victoria money? No, not necessarily like that. What this is, though, is kind of a situation where, as we have here on the South Island, we have all of our municipalities, and then we have the Capital Regional District. The Capital Regional District provides many services for the municipalities it encompasses, right? So as a result, these municipalities transfer funds to the CRD in order for these to be provided. Things like sewer, water, etc., cetera, um, certain parks, all of this through the CRD provided by the CRD and each of the municipalities pays a little bit into the CRD in order to ensure this happens. Okay, great. Purpose of this video was really to outline our major revenue sources for a local government. 
was to kind of recognize that, hey, property taxes, user fees, those are the primary sources that come from their constituents, from the people in their area, and to witness that, hey, at the local level, really unjust, really unfair tax regimes, really backwards, very regressive. Outside of that, a lot of funds at the local level come from kind of wherever they can grab them. From senior levels of government through grants, primarily grants in lieu of taxes, from developers, if you can. City of Langford has run into a bit of controversy in their use of these DCCs to fund projects. That is, they have heavily relied on these DCCs to meet a lot of the revenue requirements. And then they've gone around and they've almost advertised on the behalf of the developers saying, hey, this developer built this park because that developer contributed to the DCC. So while they're beneficial, while they kind of show us that, yes, some municipalities, some local governments need access to these external these external revenue sources, DCCs can be potentially a great part of that. Really what we're seeing is that at the local level, you're strapped, your tax base is really regressive, really backwards, and you do have to reach out where you can, especially if you are a growing, a growing local government with big ambitions. Revenue is always tight. It's going to be tough to really meet the services that you can be expected to meet. Okay. Through this video, we have evaluated major revenue sources as well as the difficulties in local taxation and the difficulties in ensuring a fair and just taxation at the local level. If you have any questions from this video, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to post on to D2L. And of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.